Lord, we thank you for your word. And as we open this chapter, we pull back the veil on one of Satan's favorite places to attack and destroy lives. And so I pray, Father, that you would open the word to our hearts simply, that we might get it, so we don't have to be ignorant of his devices, his ways, but be wise. And so, Lord, I pray that you would take this one text and you would unfold it and open it to each heart that is here, that they might grow in their walk, and they might know how to conduct themselves in the house of God. So we thank you, Lord, and we pray your blessing on this time by the power of your Holy Spirit. We ask for your help in Jesus' name. Amen. Chapter 2, verse 1. We went through a little of this last week, but we'll remind ourselves. Paul said, But I determined this with myself, that I would not come again to you in heaviness. What does that mean? He's already shown up once, and it wasn't a good visit. It was painful for everybody. For if I make you sorry, who is he then that maketh me glad, but the same which is made sorry by me? And I wrote this same unto you. Again, we feel this sorrowful letter we don't have that was pretty, pretty direct. I wrote this same unto you, lest when I came I should have sorrow from them of whom I ought to rejoice. Having confidence in you all that my joy is the joy of you all. What was Paul's joy? Well, I would like to venture the guess that it was to walk with Jesus, the one whose church he had persecuted, who interrupted him on the road to Damascus, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus whom you persecute. In other words, you touch in my church, you touch in me. And so suddenly he, encountering the Lord, repented and, and wanted, and so he's sought to walk with the Lord now and be fruitful to the one whose church he had persecuted. And so that's why he says, my hope is my joy is the joy of you all, that you people at Corinth want to walk with God. Now, what are the three big things Corinth is into? Suing? Sex and sports. It's a town, again, that's like Vegas on steroids. It's a rough town. And he said, my hope is my joy is the joy of you all, to walk with the Lord, to do the right thing. That has been my hope, and that's why I wrote to you. So verse 4, out of much anguish and affliction of heart, I wrote unto you with many tears, not that you should be grieved. I wasn't trying to just trash you, some sort of a tirade. But that you might know the love which I have more abundantly unto you. And you might be saying, well, <laughs> if he wrote a painful letter, how's that loving? He wants them right with God. So verse 5, but if any have caused grief, he has not grieved me, but in part, that I may not overcharge you all. Sufficient to such a man is this punishment which was inflicted of many. Now, some of you may be saying, I'm really late to the game. Who is he talking about and what happened? Glad you asked. Turn to 1 Corinthians 5. Left turn. If you were with us in this chapter, you already know. If you were not, we're going to review for a minute. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Paul writes and says, It is reported commonly among you that there's fornication. And such fornication is not as so much as named among the Gentiles. They're in a city that's like Vegas on steroids. And somebody within the church is involved in a sin that even the unbelieving pagans wouldn't do. That's pretty over the top. What is it? That one should have his father's wife. Somebody's in a relationship with his stepmom who appears to be currently still married to his dad. So who needs daytime soaps? Just read your Bible. And you're puffed up. You've not mourned that he that has done this deed might be taken away from among you. You've been trying to show your, your tolerance, so to speak, the grace, the love that this guy's just floating around. Verse 3, but even though as absent in the body, I may not be there, but I'm present in spirit. And this is easy. I've judged it already as though I were present concerning him that has so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. That sounds official. It's emphatic. When you are gathered together, and my spirit, I'm with you in spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, throw them out. 
That's what he's saying. Verse 5, deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. This is interesting. That the spirit might be saved until the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glorying about this is not good. Don't you know a little leaven will ruin the whole lump? Goes to verse 9. And so he says, I wrote to you in an epistle not to... Wait a second. Verse 9. I wrote to you in an epistle. What's on the top right corner of your Bible? What exactly is there? 1 Corinthians. What did he just say? I wrote to you in an epistle. What did you just learn? There's a prior letter. Do we have it? No. Okay, well, here you go. I wrote to you in another letter not to company with fornicators. This shouldn't be a mystery. Yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world or with the covetous or extortioners, idolaters, for then you must needs go out of the... You'd have to leave the planet. But I've written to you not to keep company if any man is called a brother or sister, a fellow believer... If they be a fornicator, covetous, idolater, railer, drunkard, extortioner, don't even eat with them. Notice what he said. Verse 13. Those who are without, God will judge. Within the church, you handle it. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. Let me sum up. You got somebody involved in sin in your church. Even the Gentiles won't do it. You already should know what the rules are on this. Throw them out. Well, apparently they were dragging their feet on doing that. Back to our chapter. Which is why finally there came this painful letter, which we don't have. Now we pick up again verse 5. If any has caused grief, he has not grieved me, but in part, that I may not overcharge you all. Sufficient to such a man is this punishment, which was inflicted of many. What punishment? They threw them out. What else did they not do with them? Don't even eat with them. So eventually the church got convicted. We're condoning something that is absolutely wrong as far as the relationship's point of view. And they threw them out. Well, when the church finally got right in dealing with this behavior and threw them out, he being thrown out, now outside of church, people won't even fellowship with him. Guess what God used that to do? Convict him. So then he started to realize what I'm doing is wrong. These people won't even acknowledge me. This, but they just throw me out. That's it. You're out. Maybe I am wrong. Okay. Verse 6, sufficient to such a man. That is exactly the same statement used in 1 Corinthians 5. Deliver such a one, which is why we feel it's the same person. Sufficient to such a one is this punishment which was inflicted of many. So that contrarywise, rather, you ought rather to forgive him. Wait a minute. Why should they forgive him? There's a murmuring among sheep. He repented. How many agree with that? Wait a minute. So if someone repents of something they did wrong, we should forgive them. All right, good. So far, so good. Contrarywise, you ought rather to forgive him. And comfort him, lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. Well, how do you know he's really sorry? We'll get to that. How do you know he's really sorry? We'll get to that. Lest such a one be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. Wherefore, I beseech you, I beg you. Now he's begging. I beg you that you would confirm your love toward him. In other words, people, the guy repented. <laughs> Welcome him back. Now this gets to be interesting. Because we're told this is an area Satan loves to attack. Look at verse 11. Don't be ignorant of the enemy's devices, right? Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, don't be ignorant of his devices. What are his devices? He's into destroying relationships, but we'll come back to that. So here's the case. Somebody got caught up in a pretty bad sin. The church dragged its feet about dealing with it. They finally get convicted by Paul. They finally deal with it. They finally push the guy out. And pushing him out, he finally realized he's doing something very wrong. He gets convicted, finally gets out of the relationship, apparently restores with his father, gets out of this mess that he was in with his stepmother, and begins to try and get things right. Comes back to the church, and they go, mm-hmm. So Paul's now having to say, look, the work has been done. The Spirit of God has convicted him. He's back. Call off the dogs. The guy repented. 
See, that's a problem, isn't it? Someone, for example, will depart out of their marriage, get into an affair, and then God finally gets through and completely busts them on the issue, and they finally get right, they, they, they get out of it, they repent, they come back to their spouse, they reconcile with their spouse. Praise God, the marriage is healed. They start trying to go forward, and other people around them in the body of Christ go, mm-hmm, wait a second. If the guy's wife forgave him, or if the lady's husband forgave her, and they're able to reconcile before the Lord, why can't you? Well, because I'm just so upset. Wait a second. The person who was really offended forgave them. They're really repentant. Well, how do you know they're really sorry? We'll get to that. But if they're truly repentant, and they're truly getting right with God, then shouldn't we then restore them? Now, please understand, sin within a believer's life may limit them from certain places they can serve. For example, as a pastor. If a pastor falls, I don't think he should be back in his pulpit, which is a healthy reminder to stay out of trouble. There may be consequences, but the fact is, if the guy's repented or the lady's repented and the spouse has received them back and the marriage is healed, well, then where's the rest of the body of Christ to say, praise God, you're back? See, this is all the way that the devil tries to destroy relationships. But we'll get into it. We'll look at it in a minute. So this is where we are. The guy has repented. The punishment was sufficient. Now you should show your love to him, lest he gets overwhelmed with sorrow. Here he repents and nobody receives him. So verse 8, I beg you that you would confirm your love toward him. The guy repented. Welcome him back. Does anybody in this room not make mistakes? We all agree we all make mistakes. Everybody, everybody honest with that one? I think we're all big enough to realize some mistakes are more damaging than others. Yes? It's one thing to, you know, say, put a fork in the microwave. It's another thing to completely destroy a relationship. True? They're both mistakes, but the implications are much different. Okay, fine. The guy repented. Therefore, I beseech you, confirm your love toward him. For to this end also did I write. Here's the reason I sent that painful letter. One that I may know the proof of you. Is this church going to honor God's word and walk with God, or are they going to compromise, and now they're not a good witness? So he wrote to the Corinthians to say, whose side are you on? Are you on the Lord's side, or are you on compromise's side? Now, I know this is, I'm, I know what you're thinking. How is this possibly relevant to the church today? <laughs> For this end, I wrote to you that I might know the proof of you, whether you be obedient in all things, even things that are potentially painful. So, to whom you forgive or pardon anything, I forgave also, or forgive also. For if I forgave anything, to whom I forgave it, for your sakes, forgave it I in the person of Christ. And you might say, well, why is he saying this? Because back in chapter 5, verse 4, he said, look, I've judged already, and in the name of the Lord Jesus, throw him out. So in other words, as an apostle, with authority from Jesus, on the road to Damascus, on his behalf, get him out. Now that the guy's repented, he invokes the same type of authority as an apostle of the Lord Jesus, whom I met on the road to Damascus. If you've forgiven him and he's really repentant, then in the name of Christ, I forgive also. So the same essential, you know, condemnation given to get him out is now given as restoration. Everybody with me? Which again ties it to chapter 5, 1 Corinthians, which is why we feel this is what's being referred to. Because here it is exactly the same order. Such a one and in the person of Christ. Those two elements were in chapter 5 in the first round. To whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. And if I forgave anything, to whom I forgave it for your sakes, forgave it I in the person or on the behalf of Christ. Lest Satan should get advantage of us. Now we'll come back to that. Verse 12. Furthermore. When I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, does Paul like to preach? How many have read the book of Acts? Does he like to preach all night if you let him? Yes, he can. Stay away from windows. Yes, he can. If you don't know, go read. A door was opened. An opportunity to preach Christ's gospel came to me of the Lord. Verse 13. But I had no rest in my spirit. Because I found not Titus, who we believe either bore the painful letter or immediately followed it. So he's wondering, did they like put a hit on Titus? Is he done? Is he, you know, I found not Titus, my brother. But taking my leave of them at Troas, I went from thence into Macedonia, northern Greece. Wait a second. Paul was so troubled about what was going on in this church and the potential compromises and all the other repercussions 
that he was not able to focus on an open door of ministry. That's how bad it was. Here's this great opportunity to preach Christ. Hearts are open, but he's so, his mind is so in Corinth. And what happened and what, what are they going to do that he finally, I got to leave. And he went back to go and try and find Titus. That's how overwhelming it was to him. Verse 14. Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph. Wait a minute. Verse 13. I found the rest in my spirit. Taking my leave, I went to Macedonia. Verse 14. Thanks be to God, which always causes us to triumph. Do you get a sense something happened between 13 and 14 we don't have here? Am I the only one? Bit of a change in tone, don't you think? The question is, why? Now, if you've read through your Bible, the New Testament, you'll notice that Paul has little digressions. Anybody caught those that Paul has? He kind of goes off a little bit, talks about something. Am I the only one? Okay. What you have encountered here is the whopper of digressions. It is actually called the great digression. What do you mean? Let me show you how great it is. Go from here to chapter 7. Chapter 7 is actually where the thought picks up. He digresses from 2 to 7. Now let's try and put these pieces together and see if it makes sense to you. I had no rest in my spirit. I found not Titus, my brother. Taking my leave of them, I went from thence into Macedonia. Now chapter 7, verse 5. When we were coming to Macedonia. Hey, that fits, doesn't it? Aha, here it is. When we were coming to Macedonia, our flesh had no rest. We were troubled on every side. Without were fightings. Did we do the right thing? Maybe I was too harsh. Whatever. Within were fears. What happened to Corinth? What are they doing with that letter? What happened to Titus? What are they doing with Titus? Nevertheless, God that comforteth those that are cast down comforted us by the coming of Titus. Interesting. What did we learn in chapter 1? God who comforts us in all our afflictions so that we can then comfort others with the comfort we receive from God. So now here he is again affirming that principle. God that comforts those that are cast down comforted us. Now notice, please, the obvious. God who promises to comfort us comforted Paul through another person, through Titus. You know, sometimes you're like, oh, God, where are you? And I don't sense you. And what's going on? And, and guess what? Sometimes the way he responds is through other people. Don't miss how important it is to be part of the body of Christ and to minister one to another. Because you might think, oh, I'm having a long day or whatever. And yet God moves on your heart. You talk to someone, you encourage them. You were the encouragement they had been asking God for that morning and you didn't even know it. So God does send comfort and sometimes he sends it by people. God comforted us by the coming of Titus, not by his coming only. It was good to see he's still alive. Don't mistake that. But by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you, watching what happened when they got the letter. He told us your earnest desire for what? To get right. He told us of your mourning over what? What they had allowed and had been so resistant to deal with. Your fervent mind toward me to be back in fellowship with Paul when he told me this so that I rejoiced the more. For though I made you sorry with a letter, that's that letter again we don't think we have, I do not repent. The word is regret. I do not regret or dread of consequences. I do not regret, though I did regret, for I perceive that the same epistle, the same letter, has made you sorry though it were but for a season. Very important here, and I want to lay it out to you for this reason. The word regret speaks of, again, regret or dread of consequences, and it is, it is one word in the Greek for being upset you've done something. Okay? Regret. That is different than repentance. Repentance in the Greek is metanoia, different word. And that word is to go from one direction, turn and go the other. When God interrupted your life, showed you your need for a savior, showed you your sin that he must judge, and you repented, you turned from doing all this stuff to turning and now seeking to come back and get right with God. That's repentance. It's essentially a 180 degree turn going the opposite direction to embrace God rather than trying to run away from God. That's repentance, okay? And you might say, well, what's the big deal? When Judas went into the temple and threw down the money, it said he regretted what he did. 
I've betrayed innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? You see to it. And then he left. They took the money and bought the field of blood, al Obama. So that's regret. He went out and hung himself. Paul, on the road to Damascus, who are you, Lord? He repented. What would you have me to do, Lord? There's a big difference. What do you mean? Because if we were to go and interview everybody in incarcerated in you know, Chester County, and we asked them, are you sorry? They would all tell us, they're sorry, they're in jail. Right? They're sorry. But the question is, sorry for what? Are they sorry they're caught? Or are they sorry for what they did? You see, there's a big difference. Well, why are you pointing this out? Because you want to know about how do I know when someone's really sorry versus they just regret getting caught. Everybody with me? Okay, so here he says, listen, I rejoice not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. I wrote your letter and I was regretting it. I, I was afraid of the consequences. I was afraid, but it made you sorry only for a season, but it produced something. Verse 9, now I rejoice not that you were made sorry. That's not the goal, but that you sorrowed to a changing of your mind and direction. Repentance. They finally realized what they were condoning. They finally realized what the testimony of the church was as this guy is sitting there doing this, this thing. And so they, wait a minute. And they finally got right. They repented. Well, what does that produce? Let's look. You were made sorrow, or you sorrowed to repentance. You were made sorry after a godly manner, changing in behavior. That you might receive damage by us in nothing. We spoke the truth to you. You got right. And God used it. Here's the key, verse 10. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be regretted, is the idea again, the back to regret, not to be regretted of, but the sorrow of this world works death. One is to be sorry you were caught and exposed. The other is to be sorry before a holy God that your sin forced his son to go to the cross and he had to judge it. Okay. Well, let's see what it says. You sorrowed after a godly sorrow. It brought a change in the mind, metanoia, repentance, which brought you to salvation, not to be repented of. The sorrow, verse 10, of the world works death. For behold, this selfsame thing that you at Corinth sorrowed after a godly sort. And once they sorrowed after a godly sort, they took this guy who was in the sin and they threw him out. Because they repented and got right with God, their action proved it. Once they repented as a church and got right with God and threw him out, guess what happened to him? He realized the conviction of God. He got right with God, repented, and healed the relationships. It was a test with big impacts or big implications. So you sorrowed after godly sort. Verse 11, and here's what came from it. Number one, what carefulness or earnestness it wrought in you. Once they realized what they did, they wanted to do everything they could to make it right. How do you know when someone's really repentant or sorry, as we say? Once they realize what they've done to another, especially in the relationship level here, they should then seek immediately to do whatever they can to make it right. Okay, so how do you know? Number one, they try to go back and make it right. As much as I offended you, I did whatever, get out of the relationship, do whatever. How many remember the movie Fireproof? Remember that? And remember when he finally repents over his pornography use of the computer and he goes outside, takes a baseball bat and beats his computer up and the neighbor's like watching him, Caleb? Remember that? That was an object lesson in repentance. I realize this thing is destroying my home and my marriage. I don't want it to have that power anymore. So in his case, he took it out and put it out of action. I'm not saying you take a baseball bat to everything. Okay, just that was not carte blanche. But in that case, that's how he showed some of his repentance. He destroyed that which was destroying his relationship with his wife went out and beat the computer and tossed it away. What carefulness it wrought in you. Number one, yea, what clearing of yourselves. The idea is to make themselves pure. That we're, We don't agree to this. This guy's, you're out of order, man. You need to go. They did what they had to do to say, we don't want any part of that. We're done with that. That's different than, well, who says it's wrong? That's wrong. We don't want any part of it. So carefulness, clearing of themselves, we're not part of this, we don't agree with it, we're out of this. Yea, 
What indignation, realizing they had been duped. Anybody here like being duped? Me neither. What indignation, we were wrong, we should have been known better. What fear, that speaks of godly respect or awe. Yea, what vehement desire, what? To get it right. Yea, what revenge, the idea is vindication. We're not part of this anymore. In all these things, you have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Let me translate. Having come to conviction over what they allowed, they then were repentant before God, and they took the steps necessary to clean this thing out and be beyond reproach on it. That is, here is the password to my phone. That is, no, this person's out of my life. That is, here, take the computer. Whatever it is that it is causing you not to be in the light, they surrendered. So that nobody can mistake they're serious and this needs to go. That's what real repentance looks like. In fact, it's kind of this idea. Real repentance is not like a movie where you need the subtitles. Somebody's talking, blah, blah, blah. He's like, what is he saying? Well, what he's trying to say is he's really sorry. But well, then why doesn't he say it and do it? I get people ask me all the time, Pastor, what do you think this is going on? Like, I've got a secret squirrel decoder ring. And I go, oh, yeah, that's right. Really, it should be obvious to everybody when someone's repentant. When someone's broken over the damage they've caused to someone else and they realize what's happened in Christ, wait a second, I'm going to make this right. It should be obvious. I don't remember exactly the quote. It may be Spurgeon, but he said, let the story of a man's repentance eclipse that of his sin. Let people go, wow, that guy is really sorry. Or that lady, look at this. I mean, they, they're really broken over what happened. They're trying to make it as right as they can make it, as much as lies within them. So, where am I going with this? Real repentance is obvious. Real repentance doesn't need someone to explain kind of what you think you might be seeing. Real repentance is clear. And in the case of this church at Corinth, praise God, they were convicted, and they showed real repentance. And their repentance convicted the person in the sin and forced him into repentance too. So I wrote unto you, verse 12, I didn't do it for the cause or his cause that had done the wrong, nor for his cause that had suffered the wrong, the, the Father. I wrote that our care of you in the sight of God might appear unto you. I wrote to you about the welfare of the church and its testimony for God. That's what I was most concerned about. Therefore, we were comforted in your comfort. Yes, and we were exceedingly the more joyed for the joy of Titus, because his spirit was refreshed by you all. Titus showed up, they got straightened out, they showed him they were sorry. If I've boasted to him of anything of you, I'm not ashamed. But as we speak all things to you in truth, even so our boasting, which I made before Titus, is found to truth. And his inward affection is more abundant toward you when he remembered your obedience of you all and how with fear and trembling you received him. That must have been some letter. I rejoice, therefore, that I have confidence in you all in all things, that you will do what's right. So back to our chapter. Verse 11. Lest... Satan should get advantage of us. We are not ignorant of his devices. Do you realize if you study the record of the devil, Satan, the first thing you will note is he is a destroyer of relationships. And the first relationship he destroyed was his own with God. Hadn't thought of that. Yes, he did. He destroyed his own relationship with God through pride. The second relationship he destroyed with God was Eve's. The third relationship he destroyed with God was Adam's, who transgressed. So right from the beginning, the first thing we see on his mug, you know, his rap sheet or his M.O. is that he loves to destroy relationships. And he will not only destroy relationships in the forward direction of someone getting into adultery or arguments or gossip or backbiting or slander or whatever, but it will also let the backflow from that also destroy relationships. So it's not just two people. It'll be a whole group, a home fellowship, a church, a, a church, parachurch ministry, pregnancy counseling ministry, mission organization. So not only will he seek to destroy relationships in it, but in the process of destroying those relationships, will then try to use collateral damage to destroy as many relationships as possible around it. That's what he does. Now, once you're aware of that, and that's how he operates, we shouldn't then be ignorant of his devices. You know, when Paul wrote to Timothy, and he talked about elders and deacons, in the section of the deacons, he says, likewise the wives, not slanderers. The word is diabolos, often translated demon or devils. 
The idea of slander spoke of gossip. In other words, what he was saying is when we gossip about other people, whose work are we doing for them? The devil's. And we should be wise enough to realize that, hey, Jesus told us how to deal with issues among believers. If your brother offends you, go to him. Don't create an entourage who agree with you. Don't whatever. Don't do a circuit, you know, a email. Don't defriend. Don't. Go to them. Tell them what the problem is. If they hear you, problem solved. Got your brother or sister back. Wasn't that easy? But that's not the route people go. They go to gossip. They go to slander. They go to backbiting. They go to manipulation. And they start doing the devil's work for him. And sadly, when they go down those paths, what that is is really a lack of spiritual maturity. For those of us who, who want to walk with the Lord and honor his word, what we should do is go to them. And it might be solved in one conversation. We're not ignorant of his devices. He will get as much damage out of a relationship issue, no matter who it involves, as he can. So do you want to be part of it? Or do you want to be, have, you know, be able to say, wait a minute, you shouldn't be talking to me. You should be talking to them and help solve it. How many remember the old TV show, Adam 12? First service, bunch of hands. This service getting a little thinner. Third service, forget it. They'll all be Googling. What is Adam 12? Somebody came up after first service and said, I got a picture of the original car at a motor show in Hershey. I'm like, nice. Adam 12 was a police show. How many know what a 211 in progress is? It was a robbery. Now look at first, second Corinthians 211. We are not ignorant of his devices. Don't get robbed. 211 in progress. Lest Satan get advantage of us, he doesn't care how or what, he is here to destroy relationships. Don't take the bait. We are not ignorant of his devices. Now, verse 14, let's see if it makes sense. Now, thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ. Fits pretty well now, doesn't it? We got it. Titus showed up. They repented. Things are good. The guy repented. They're receiving him back. This is awesome. Thanks be to God. It causes us to triumph in Christ. Makes manifest the savor or the aroma of his knowledge. How? By us in every place. What do you mean? For we are unto God a sweet savor or aroma of Christ in them that are saved. And we are unto God an aroma of Christ and them that perish. What do you mean? If I say to you, New Year's Day, feathers and banjos, what do you think? Mummers. Everybody with me? How many, how many missed that? Need help? And look, I'm not making fun of them. I don't want a bunch of mummers outside beat me up after service. All right? Just, just know that. In the local Philadelphia tradition, you would understand a mummers parade. True? Okay. Notice what he said. Thanks be to God who always leads us into triumph in Christ. In the Greco-Roman world, they had the visual. What is it? When an army returned from conquering, the generals in front, then his officers, then the soldiers, then the things they took, the spoil, and then the prisoners. And as they get close to Rome, in this case, where they would celebrate, as they get to the outskirts of town, crowds gather, they're there, they welcome them, they know they're coming. As they get further in the town, now they smell the incense, which was all part of official ceremony. So as the front of the line gets in, they go, ah, victory. It's the smell of victory. Here's the incense. They've conquered. They're coming in. They're going to be rewarded. Everybody's going to say, well done. Thanks for keeping the empire safe. And here we go. But at the end of the line, as they finally get in with smelling range and they smell the incense, to them it's death because they are going to be led through the city, mocked, and brought to the arena where they will be put in to fight the gladiators, the wild beasts, and whatever else they want to do with their prisoners. That's where they're going. They are entertainment to die in the arena for the public. So, same incense, same event. For one, it's victory. For another, it is death, coming death. Now, read that section again. We are unto God a sweet savor, verse 15, of Christ. And them that are saved, as we rejoice in the fact that they know the truth, we know the truth, God's forgiveness, isn't this awesome? Weird days out there, yeah, but the Lord's coming. There's this sense of hope. But for those who don't know the Lord, the last days are going to be like the days of Noah. And they're here. And God is going to judge this world. Not with a flood. That was a promise he would never judge again with a flood. That rainbow is about judgment. 
over the fervent heat. Everywhere you go, you emit one odor or the other. And I'm not talking dial or deodorant or secret or whatever. You emit one odor or the other to the people around you, to those who are seeking after God, to those who know God, the encouragement that, hey, and you know how it goes. You start talking to me. This guy isn't cursed at all. Say, you go to, hey, hey, how you doing? Yeah, you start talking, right? Everybody knows. Soccer field, whatever. Other places, you listen, like, well, mm -hmm, and you try to reach out. Everywhere you go, you give off an aroma. Well, that's overwhelming. I mean, how do I keep reading? To one where the savor of death unto death, those would be the guys in the back of the parade, to another with a savor of life unto life, those who are conquerors through Christ. Here's your question. Who is sufficient? Who can handle these things? If that's what hangs in the balance everywhere we go, who's sufficient for these things? He'll tell us next week in our chapter. Our sufficiency is of Christ. Everywhere you go, you give an aroma, whether you know it or not. For we are not, he says, as many which corrupt the word of God. That's a problem today. But we are those of insincerity, or of sincerity, but as, those of, but as of God, we in the sight of God speak in Christ. So in other words, we don't hide anything without wax. We're transparent. You can take all the look you want, but we handle the word faithfully. Wow. So this week you're about to go out and be among a whole bunch of people. You have one of two aromas. You know... The backbiting, the fighting, and the gossiping, and the dissension, the unforgiveness. Unforgiveness leads to bitterness. Bitterness defiles everything it touches. As they say, bitterness is poison you drink for someone else. And the reason the devil works so hard to destroy relationships within godly families and among the family of God is because Jesus said, by your love, where? One for another, men will know what? You're my disciples. So little wonder why the devil works so hard to try and destroy any and all relationships he can get his hands on to trash our witness for Christ. So let's stand, let's pray, and you people are about to waft out of this room and be an aroma all week. Father God, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you that you have sent your son to pay for our sins. We deserve to be in the back of that parade and headed to death and destruction. But we're more than conquerors through Christ who loved us, saved us, forgave us of our sins. Lord, if there is anyone here that doesn't know you, let today be the day they go beyond regret to real repentance, and they realize they have offended a holy God who will judge all things. That day is coming. And so now is their chance ask your forgiveness to truly be born again by the power of the Holy Spirit by putting their faith in the name of Jesus of Nazareth and opening their heart to him as their Savior and confessing him as their Lord if you'll do that between you and God where you stand right now ask him for his forgiveness ask him to come into your heart and your life and it's from your heart you will be saved and you will change from the inside out. Thank you, Lord. Help us to be wise to the devil's devices. In Jesus' name, amen.